Ladies and gentlemen, please stay tuned. Our program will begin momentarily. Good morning. Our program will begin momentarily. Good morning, and welcome to today's discussion entitled, The Man Vladimir Putin Fears Most, Russia and the Case of Alexei Navalny. Thank you for joining this online event hosted by AJC Berlin. We are very pleased that Mr. Mark Gagliotti was able to join us today to share his expertise with us. Mark Galliotti is Senior Associate Fellow at the Royal United Services Institute. He's an expert in modern Russia, especially its security politics, and is currently working on projects exploring non-kinetic forms of war fighting. He's a prolific author, hosts the podcast In Moscow Shadow, and runs a blog under the same name. Today's discussion will be hosted by AJC Berlin's director, Dr. Remco Lehmhuis. Before we begin, I would like to remind you that you can submit your questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Remco, the floor is yours. Thank you, Allegra, and good morning, everybody, and uh, especially good morning to you, Mark, and thanks for joining us again. Uh, we last spoke, I guess, in March or April, talking about conspiracy theories regarding uh, coronavirus and Russian disinformation. And here we are again, but with a slightly different topic. And uh, thank you for taking time out of your busy, busy schedule, um, especially since I learned of today that a, a Dutch newspaper referred to you as the Bentley of Russia experts. So we are delighted to have you with us this morning and talk about the case of Alexander Navalny and Alexei Navalny and everything surrounding you know, what happened and the political consequences of his poisoning. And before we get into the more, uh, the more European German political side, Maybe you can give us an idea of who Alexei Navalny is, um, why is he important in Russia, and why does the Kremlin and maybe the president, maybe President Putin himself, feel threatened by him? It's, it's interesting this whole question of who is Alexei Navalny, not least because there's often a discussion about well, what do you call him. Uh, it's interesting that, uh, for example, Russian state outlets always refer to him as the blogger, Alexei Navalny, which is true. Um, but, you know, it's, 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 it's a little bit like me call, calling me dog walker Mark Galliotti. You know, that, that may be true, but that's not necessarily the whole truth. In some ways, I mean, he could be considered not the opposition leader, because there is no single unified opposition to the Kremlin, but he is in some ways, I would say, the closest thing there is to an opposition leader in, in Russia. And the reason why he's dangerous to the Kremlin, I would say that there are three reasons. One of them is he is this astonishingly um, forensic, but also um, accessible chronicler of the corruption of the elite. Uh, the, the, the videos he posts with drone footage of excessively large dachas and all the other sorts of details um, represent you know, the closest thing that, that there is we have to an actual sort of uh, 
digest of the corrupt deals of the rich and powerful. And although on one level, that's relatively insignificant for Russians because they know that their elite are dirty. Um, it's not actually as if they were shocked, shocked to discover that people don't live on their salaries alone. But on the other hand, what it does mean is it gives him this incredible, I think he's identified this incredibly powerful potential political base. Because corruption and resistance and opposition to it is probably the one truly unifying force across the Russian Federation. It's something that um, you know, a middle-class Muscovite professional, a bus driver from Vladivostok, a startup entrepreneur from Rostov-on-Don and a dock worker from Arkhangelsk all have their own experiences, you know, whether it's having to pay off the local sort of health inspector or whether it's you know, to get into the proper hospital or whatever, at some point they have been victims of corruption. And so this is something that unifies people across class, regional, ethnic and other boundaries. And I think this is one of the things that makes it such a powerful force. So that's the first thing. Second thing is, in some ways, he reminds Russians that politics exists. Authoritarian regimes do not, on the whole, depend on fear. They depend on apathy, on hopelessness, on the sense it's not worth going up against the, the, the state because nothing positive can come of it. Well, simply by, by struggling, and you know, you've got to remember that you know, this poisoning is obviously the most dramatic escalation, but this is a man who's been arrested 13 times, who's already been poisoned once before, who's had antiseptic dye splashed on his face such that he almost lost an eye. I mean, this is a man who's, who's faced a lot and yet he has continued. And so it does give that sense that there is still hope, there is still politics. And the third reason why he's dangerous is very specific. This, this weekend, there are um, a whole slew of local elections in Russia. And one of the things that Navalny was doing, and this probably is more likely than anything else to be the reason for the attack on him, was promoting the so-called smart voting campaign, an attempt to get people to vote tactically for the, ha the candidate, regardless of who they are, independent, communist, whatever, who is most likely to be able to unseat the pro-government United Russia candidate. Um, and that is something that we know worries the Kremlin and it worries all the various local satraps whose job is to make sure the right um, votes sort of get, get counted, if not cast. Um, and in this respect, so he was also particularly important in mobilizing collective opposition. Because the thing about the smart vote campaign is absolutely, it says it doesn't matter whether or not you absolutely agree with each other. You don't have to, and this is not about one movement with one common platform. This is about the fact that there are a lot of us who agree that this government is useless, corrupt, has outlived its, its uh, value and needs to go or at least be punished for how it's treated us. And that I think is very powerful. So I think it, it, it's, it's all these things together that have made Navalny, the Navalny phenomenon, we could almost call it, um, such a problem for the Kremlin. Not because he's about to bring them down, not because he, there's going to be free and fair elections so long as this current incumbent is in the Kremlin, but because he keeps politics alive and aimed precisely at unseating the government candidate by collective activism. Okay, but is, is there any, but still is it, does he have any political program? You know, what are his, you know, is there something, you know, he can propose to voters, you know, what is coming after the current regime? So is there, what are his political positions and his well, ideas? Well, interesting thing. I mean, he has no political party. And again, I think in hindsight, the Kremlin might one day come to realize that this was a mistake. Every time he's tried to form a political party by one subterfuge or just simply you know, rule breaking um, approach, the Kremlin has blocked it. So he had his foundation for the struggle against corruption, the FBK, which is currently in the process of being wound up because it's faced so many, frankly, spurious lawsuits. Um, but because he's not got a political party, he's not been effectively required to create a program. We have a sense of where he is. He is, I would say, a liberal democratic nationalist. Um, you know, he, he believes in Russia. And for example, he, he didn't speak out against the annexation of Crimea. Um, and in, in the past, you know, people sometimes call him, you know, a, a sort of a nationalist because he's sort of 
once or twice said some racist things about particularly people from the Caucasus region. Well, I'm not in any way obviously condoning that, but in some ways I think that's part of his strength. He is just racist enough to be able to appeal to ordinary Russians for whom you know, a certain degree of racism is, is, is quite sort of commonplace. But broadly speaking, I mean, he is essentially a, a liberal Democrat. If he was in Western politics, we would probably think him as being on the soft right uh, of, of, of Western politics. But as I said, at the moment, in some ways this is an interesting parallel actually with the opposition in, in Belarus, rather than saying, this is exactly the kind of Russia we want to build. What he's actually saying is, for the moment, we need to address this corrupt power structure. And we need to, to address that to open things up that then we can have real democratic politics and those kind of discussions about the future. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so you, you wrote one or two pieces on your blog, um, which I uh, recommend people that are uh, listening or viewing our conversation today to to read and you questioned at least the idea I, mean, I guess in western europe right now there is more or less a consensus that the kremlin so putin is directly somehow involved in this poisoning and you wrote one or two pieces questioning this direct involvement or that uh, Putin is directly responsible for this, stressing directly. And um, so what's your, what's your thinking on this, especially in light of the news reports we've seen yesterday from German authorities that the poison, um, Navalny was poisoned with, the Novichok, uh, from the Novichok family was a new substance that, or a new, uh, a new poison that people or agencies uh, and security services in the West weren't familiar with until last week, which for German authorities uh, points to the fact that there needs to be some form of government involvement because just of the fact that it's new. But you again wrote something like it doesn't have to be necessarily some, some state involvement. It could also be rich, uh, Russian oligarchs. So maybe you can elaborate a little bit on your thinking. On... I think my view is, look, I honestly don't know whether or not Putin issued an order, made a hint, or just simply retrospectively blessed the attempt to poison Navalny. And I'll, I'll come on to, to why, in a way, it doesn't matter after I've talked about why it does matter. Um, and what it does is, is actually it says something about the nature of the Russian system. There is often this, this assumption that the Russian system is this phenomenally disciplined and controlled structure, um, the so-called power vertical with all orders coming down from the top and ultimately Putin being the Bond villain style mastermind who, who gives the orders. Well, let's face it, as, as, as people who've spent time in Russia know, that's actually not often how Russia works. And if anything, what Putin has done is very deliberately created a situation in which he, at best, gives broad instructions as to what he'd like to see, broad hints often, and a whole series of different actors and institutions, oligarchs and minigarchs, government departments, um, you know, all, all kinds of other figures, you know, even media pundits, depending on what's the issue in hand, struggle to then think, okay, how can I do something that would advance what the boss wants? And so what you tend to get is a whole variety of different initiatives. And the ones that are unsuccessful, the Kremlin can just simply disown and say, nothing to do with us. The ones that were successful, then the individuals get rewarded. And often then what happens is the Kremlin then throws its own resources. And in, in effect, it, it, it takes on board these things. It's, it's almost a, a venture capital model of politics is that you, know, you, you, are, you are the investor sitting there listening to all these people pitch their ideas and you decide where you want to put your money. Now, in some ways, this has actually proven quite effective for, for Putin, who is not a details-oriented man, it has to be said, in these kind of things. I mean, he's, again, he gives the impression of being terribly details-oriented when he gives his um, public press conferences and such like, he knows exactly how many figures or how much grain was produced in what region and so forth. But in terms of how he governs his country, 
he's happy to be fairly hands off. But the problem is this. He has created a situation where you, you've got what I sometimes call a murderous adhocracy. In other words, lots of individuals whose roles are not necessarily defined by their official job title. Um, and yet who have in effect been granted literally license to kill when it's in the interest of the state. A classic example would be the murder of opposition figure Boris Nemtsov back in 2015, almost certainly by Chechen leader Ramzan Kadyrov. Um, and, and that created something of a crisis, but ultimately he got away with it. So you have this situation in which ultimately lots of different people could do it. Now it has to be said, this latest news about the particular variant Novichok makes it less likely that it's anything, you know, that this was done without the acquiescence of the state at the very least. Now, this morning I was actually speaking briefly to someone who knows a lot more about toxicology and particularly Novichok than me, who said there is the possibility that it was Novichok mixed with another poison to have some kind of compound effect, which wouldn't necessarily require specialist uh, facilities. But that's an outside chance. It's more likely that this is indeed a new new version of, the, of, of that nerve agent family, which absolutely means it'll have come from the poison laboratories that we believe are controlled by the Federal Security Service, the Domestic Security Agency, the Foreign Intelligence Service, and maybe GRU military intelligence. But the point is, it's, it's important from an analytic point of view to try and think, well, okay, where did the initial impulse come from? Who might have actually said, that's it? And, and, and what it tells us about changing views in politics in Russia. But on another level, it doesn't matter at all. Firstly, because Putin obviously has to have, has to accept the uh, moral responsibility for creating the system whereby exactly he empowers a whole variety of his cronies and supporters to use violence up to and including murder. And it's worth mentioning that I might say a lot of Russians get killed. Um, we hear about the Navalny's and the Nemtsovs and so forth. But you know, if you are an investigative journalist on a regional newspaper, your life cycle is pretty much similar to that of a war correspondent, you know, but that doesn't really hit the international news. So he's created this system. But also what we have seen is the Russian state move into massive cover-up mode. So at the very least, he has chosen to retrospectively bless this and say, don't worry, we, we will have your back. We will make sure that, that sort of basically you, you are protected for what you've done. There's no serious attempt to investigate. I mean, even, I mean, after the Nemtsov killing, there was actually a serious investigation by a serious investigator who's now the, the prosecutor general. As soon as he came across the fact that there were Kadyrov's fingerprints on this, then he was withdrawn and a more politically reliable investigator was put in place. But there was at least an investigation Whereas in, in, the, in the Navalny case, what we've seen is actually a great resistance by the Kremlin to launch any kind of serious investigation. So no, this is definitely something that you know, wherever the initial impulse came from, Putin has decided to make it a Kremlin project. So, but why now? I mean, you, you talked about the regional elections coming up and um, I guess, you know, if they wanted to kill him, they, you know, a lot of other opportunities so why if you in all speculation but what could be the rationale doing it now well definitely i think that the the regional elections are significant and particularly the smart voting as i said does does worry a lot of people um and it's interesting and perhaps indicative that since then since the poisoning we've seen a whole series of raids and attacks on various local uh, sort of Navalny team offices around the country. Um, again, whether they opportunistically decided, well, while we're at it, let's go after his people, or whether this is all part of a plan, that, that's hard, harder to tell. We've also got the fact that, uh, you know, what's going on in Belarus um, is a particularly illustrative example of people power out there on the streets. I don't think they, Think that there's going to be an immediate sort of splash over but it certainly will, will have put the elite more on edge and we've seen a whole series of other local protests of which um, you know regular um, demonstrations in Khabarovsk on the Chinese border um, you know have been the most again the, the most significant and the most high profile but they're by no means unique you know this is a, a country which 
even while registering the sort of relatively high levels of approval for Putin, which doesn't really mean very much. It's kind of Putin as icon of Russia rather than because they support his policies. You know, this is a country in which there is considerable um, disaffection. COVID has not necessarily been handled well. There is a, a sense that Moscow is a sort of a, a parasitic brute that takes resources from the regions and doesn't really give much back. Putin himself is increasingly absent, and it's quite noteworthy that he's decided not to do his usual direct line, which is this sort of mammoth phone in with the nation. Um, you know, for all, all these reasons, I mean, I think this, this is a regime that, that feels an uncomfortable place. And my suspicion is, I mean, Navalny was in the past always very good at knowing exactly how far he could go. Where was the red line and staying on the right side of it? I mean, for example, um, he launched this, this devastating expose of the corruption of the former prime minister, Dmitry Medvedev. And the video of that, it's estimated, has now been watched by a majority of internet active Russians, for example. But he never went after Putin. And he never went after Putin's family, which you know, everyone knows is the real no, no. So, you know, Navalny, whether it's in terms of his own political savvy or whether because he had people within the system helping advise him, um, always stayed on the, on the right side. The possibility is, though, that in a way, the, right, the red line moved because of these circumstances, and Navalny didn't appreciate that. And in a way, he didn't shift, but suddenly he found himself on the wrong side. And fair game. And either the Kremlin went after him, or other people felt that they now had the green light. I can mix my, my colours. Um, the green light to go after him. This is all obviously speculation. Um, but the very fact, as you say, that, that now, of all times, now to launch such an escalation does say something, I think, about the overall mood within the Kremlin and within the sort of the inner elite. Yeah, and especially, I mean, you, you talked about Boris Nemtsov, who was shot and killed. So, I mean, there could be other, you know, they, they could you know, use other weapons to, to using Novichok. You know, I, I guess also, you know, this sends a signal and should send a signal that, um, you know, from my point of view, and that you know, they want in some way or another, you know, make people aware who or who may be, be behind it. And, and just maybe that's a too technical question before we transition to, to the reactions here in Western Europe and in Germany in particular. But how can you... I mean, when you use this deadly poison, um, how you know, did they want to kill him? Did they want to send a signal or you know, calculated that he might survive? Um, how can you not kill somebody with a chemical weapon? So is it, you know, was it an accident or, uh, you know, or, or did they deliberately, you know, did it so that he likely, very likely survives? Yeah, I mean, look, again, the, the honest answer is, I don't know. However, like, like any good academic or pundit, they won't stop me from talking for a little bit longer. Um, I mean, I, th I think the thing is that the reason for using poison is, as you said, it's often, it's, it's as a message. It's not just about the killing. It's about the theatricality of it. And I think this is one of the reasons why they use Novichok to try and kill Sergei Skripal in Britain because they didn't just simply want to kill an individual, they wanted to give a message to the UK government, which they felt had been breaking the terms on which Skripal had been given a pardon and, and, and released. So you know, often the thing about poison is it is both on one hand deniable, you can sometimes makes it harder to know exactly when it was done. You know, whereas with, for example, Zelim Khan Kangoshvili, who was killed in Berlin at the end of last year, you know, when someone walks up to you and shoots you, there is a distinct lack of ambiguity. I mean, it's, you might well then have to prove exactly you know, who did it and why they did it and who was behind it, but nonetheless, there is no question about what happened. With poison, there is obviously a certain degree of ambiguity. Was it really poison? Was it something else? Who did it at what point? You know, was it in the, the drink? Was it sprayed on his clothes? All these sorts of things which, which create ambiguities. But at the same time, there is that wider message precisely because it is Novichok, which in some ways has become treated as a sort of a, a Russian state signature. There is a sense of we can deny it, 
but at the same time with with, with, a, with a little bit of a kind of smirk and you know that really we did it again we come back to it actually you know smart authoritarian states do not rely on oppression if they can just simply use fear as well uh, and this is a way whereby you you target one person and you hope to intimidate a whole cohort of others but in terms of actually sort of killing him I mean, this is a difficult thing, which again, this is what one of the things that inclined me at first to suspect that the Kremlin was not directly behind it. This was not actually a sort of a Kremlin project from, from the get-go. Because what seems to have been crucial is first of all, the quick response of the uh, flight crew on the plane he was flying, that then you know, immediately detoured to Omsk. And secondly, the quick response of the um, first responders. Um, the, the medics who actually sort of first sort of went into his care, uh, who gave him atropine, which was exactly the right treatment for a, for a nerve agent. And also the interesting thing is who publicly stated at that time at first that, that it looked like poisoning. It was only later that the cover-up started and the doctors suddenly be began saying, oh, we're not sure, or just some kind of metabolic imbalance, you know, his blood sugar levels were low and all, all this other nonsense. Which again, now you, you, you would think, and maybe and, and we, we can never rule out incompetence. But, you know, at the risk of sounding morally bankrupt, if I had been in the FSB and had been in charge of Operation Murder Navalny, you know, I'd have made sure that we'd have been tracking the plane. And then if need be, we would have, in, in, you know, told Omsk ground control, nope, you're not going to let that plane, basically, you're going to let that plane con continue on. And once I knew that it was going to land at Omsk, I would have had our people in the you know, Omsk FSB busy telling the, the medical team, no rush on this one. And by the way, it's definitely not poisoning. <laughs> the fact that they didn't do this, again, as I said, it could just simply be shoddy handling because we, knew, we know this happens in any system, but particularly in, in, in the Russian one. But it also, to me, implies that actually this was a state that was still playing catch up. And only you know, after a certain point when they realized what had happened, did they then move in, in, into the cover up? But you know, it could well, could easily have been if, if, if the pilots had not wanted to detour, if there'd been some reason, if Omsk could have been covered by fog and they'd had to keep flying on, could well be that Navalny would have allied, you know, arrived as a corpse in Moscow. And then none of this international dimension would have come into play. I mean, it, it would have been a tragedy and it would have been a new story, but it would have been a new story about a Russian citizen killed on Russian soil. For re and no one really knows exactly what the details are. It's only because he survived long enough for this to become an international issue and that he was then medevaced to Germany and German scientists could, could, could get a look at him and you know, run, run tests on, on his blood and skin and urine and so forth that we know as much as we, we do know. So again, this is something that frankly um, does not speak of a smart plan to me. Mm, okay. Um, so maybe now, before we open up to questions from the audience, um, maybe let's talk uh, shortly about how you think Germany slash European Union should respond to, to this. Um, I guess overall a lot of people are surprised by um, the reaction, especially in Germany and especially from the chancellery openly for the first time openly question Nord Stream 2 and um, the you know she and the harsh words she used last week in her press conference also the foreign minister so this is also I guess something that the Kremlin hasn't ex expected um, that it, there will be this I mean as of now nothing has happened but you know just the mere fact that the chancellery is questioning completing Nord Stream 2 obviously is something that you know, people in the Kremlin are not happy about, but what is, in, you know, in, what, what is your suggestion? You know, what, what impresses the Kremlin? What would, put, what would Putin be impressed about? I mean, after Sergei Skripal, the European Union or me, European Union uh, member states uh, expelled 33 uh, Russian diplomats Obviously, this, this hasn't changed the policy of the Kremlin. So what, you know, if you could, you know, if you could put this 
what what would your suggestion be or what would you what what is it that you think that would um uh, uh change the the calculus in the kremlin well i mean it obviously this, this is a difficult challenge and in a way one has to to note beforehand one particular issue is that at other times state murders by other countries get much more of a pass. I mean, if, if one thinks at the murder of the Saudi dissident Khashoggi in Turkey, where actually, you know, he was killed in an embassy, dismembered in an embassy, and, and essentially no, nothing has happened. Now, this is not in any way an excuse for saying this is why we shouldn't do anything about Navalny. But this is just a point to say that this is why we really ought to be consistent in our application of values. Because the trouble is, what, what would it mean is when, if and when we actually respond seriously on the Navalny case, the Russians will say, this is just Russophobia. This is treating us specially. This is treating us with particular harshness compared with other countries that, that you know, you don't mind when the Chinese or the Saudis do it or whatever. And there's some truth in that. But as I said, I think the answer is, to do it more rather than to do it less. In terms of how we respond, my, my big concern is that we, we've had this, this very strong and indeed you know, laudably and uncharacteristically tough response from, from Berlin, um, which stands in an interesting contrast to the relatively meek response that followed the Khangoshvili shooting uh, at the end of, of last year, where we eventually saw two Russian diplomats expelled, but not because Russia was behind the murder, but because actually on the, or on the formal grounds that Russia wasn't helping with the investigation enough, which is a little bit weak, frankly. So we'll have to see. My, my concern is this, that particularly now it's been punted off to the European Union and, and, and you know, Chancellor Merkel saying, oh, this is essentially a European Union response. Um, European Union is not on the whole a quick and decisive uh, sort of actor in, the, in these kind of issues. And the, the risk is that in terms of the need for consensus, what we will end up with is with the usual kind of responses, some, some strong words, maybe a few expulsions, and, and that's pretty much it. And as far as the Russians are concerned, I think they regard this as frankly, just the price of doing business. So you have a, you know, a few ambassadors have, you know, having amb uh, uncomfortable conversations so you have a few of your more junior diplomats and spies being expelled. Well, that's, that's no big deal. That's, most of your embassies are larger than you need anyway. The thing about the Skripal case was there was the initial expulsion um, you know, from Britain with in, inevitable tit-for-tat expulsions of Brits from Moscow. Now, I was actually, I was in Moscow at the time. And what was interesting was when that happened, after that first sort of tit-for-tat round, Everyone I was speaking to, everyone connected with the Russian foreign ministry and generally sort of foreign policy circles within government, was sure that was the end to it. And as far as they were concerned, it's fine, that's no big deal. They had no inkling that there was going to be this massive multinational uh, wave of expulsions, and of, of whom the European Union was just actually a relatively small part um, of the overall. They, were, they only account for about a quarter of the total expulsions. And that, I think, was a very salutary blow to the Russians. First of all, expulsion of many spies did temporarily, but nonetheless, it did put a certain crimp in their intelligence operations abroad. Secondly, for a country that is so concerned to be looking like a great power, as the Russian government does, then this, the fact that there was such a wide rebuke, you couldn't just simply rule it out. You couldn't just simply say, oh, well, that's just the Brits, or even that's just the Europeans, or that's just NATO. I mean, th th this was, you know, actually quite, quite a, you know, a, a telling coalition of nations who've had enough. And thirdly, it came as a surprise. And I think that is absolutely crucial. The Russians would always try and game plan out how they think the response will be and whether it's bearable and so forth. And therefore, I think if we really want to actually hit the Russians in a way that might um, affect policy, is think in terms of, well, how can we be imaginative? How can we be asymmetrical? How can we move beyond just the usual diplomatic instruments that, frankly, we've been doing for years with no impact? And actually think of things, well, what, what is going to really bug Putin? What is going to really catch his attention? 
And I mean, in, in this article I wrote for, for the Dutch outlet, Ramot Brusland, um, I mean, I, I just kind of brainstorm a, a few ideas. Um, you know, maybe we should be allocating large chunks of money to support civil society in Belarus, now that Putin has, has clearly thrown his weight behind the Lukashenko regime. Or maybe we should be looking at other countries that are facing bullying by the Russians, such as Georgia, and provide them with some kind of assistance. Maybe it should even just simply be symbolic acts. Yes, you know, perhaps not shaking hands with Putin. Um, or if we do shake hands immediately, you know, as we do so, immediately saying, even though it's not what protocol usually would say, actually sort of say, but you know, but you you shouldn't be poisoning people like like Navalny. Um, you know all kinds of things, to, just to think about how is this actually going to affect Putin? Because we have to realize that this is a regime which frankly doesn't care about a lot of the diplomatic niceties. This is a regime which is not going to be phased by being called out and named and shamed and all these other things that frankly diplomats tend to kind of default to. So we have to think of something different and something that also says, don't believe you can predict us. Don't believe that you can be sure of the outcome. I mean, after the Skripal case, yes, it hasn't stopped them acting. But I think one of the reasons behind the Zelim Khan Kangoshvili shooting was precisely to test the waters, to get a sense, well, okay, was this just a one-off? Was this just the Skripal case was just too significant? And that actually, in fairness, I mean, not that one, to be honest, these days gets to talk about triumphs of British diplomacy much, um, but in fairness, actually, the, the Skripal response was a triumph of British diplomacy. And so there was also this sense in Moscow, well, maybe it was just that one off that, you know, that the Brits managed to, to pull this off. So I think they were testing the waters. And, it, and if there had been a tough response after Kangoshvili, I think they would have thought, hmm, maybe the new normal is a lot less permissive of certain kinds of actions. We need to basically demonstrate to, to, to the regime in, in Moscow that you know, there, there are consequences, and these consequences will actually have impact. Nord Stream 2, which is the clear sort of one in, in, in frame. My one concern about that, it's not that I actually have, you know, have any particular feelings one way or the other about the actual pipeline project. My one concern is that if it is blocked at this time, it will inevitably cause a certain amount of economic harm in Germany and also dissent in Germany. And also there are other countries in Europe that frankly were counting on that. And I think the only concern I have about Nord Stream 2 is we should be ready if the decision is made to block it. What the Russians are gonna do is seek to magnify those internal disputes. They're gonna frame this as Germany surrendering to the Americans and buying their overpriced liquid petroleum gas liquid natural gas. Um, you know, they are going to find all kinds of other ways of basically trying to use it to stir up internal tensions because that's what they do. So if we're going to block, well, if we, the European Union, the German government or whatever, is going to block Nord Stream 2, fine. But be aware that then the Russians will seek to fight back because the point is that's when you know you're getting under the Russian skin is when they try to punish you for your actions. And so we need to be aware of that and ready for that. And what about, <laughs> excuse me, and maybe just as a last question on how to retaliate. Um, there are some suggestions out there also to, to sanction individuals surrounding Putin, the oligarchs, you know, them, you know, they not being able to, to go to London or Brussels or Berlin or send the kids here to the universities and um, what about, you know, if we talk about like unusual responses, um, uh, maybe disclose information about certain people in the Kremlin, uh, you know, about the corruption, the wealth, you know, what is it that they're doing? Would that be something that would impress the Kremlin? When it comes down to it, um, Putin himself is not, I think, that interested in money these days. Um, some people say, oh, that, 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 that's what it's all about. No, I don't think so. I mean, he's, he's interested in power and his historic legacy. This is not a man who is putting money into Swiss bank accounts because he thinks one day he's going to leave Russia and buy himself a nice villa in the Caribbean and live the life of a, you know, a rich post-presidential states figure. No. I think he knows that, frankly, 
if he left Russia and the protection of Russia and traveled almost anywhere, then he would face the risk of Interpol, red warrants, war crimes, tribunals, you name it. So unless he's, he's thinking of a life spent between Venezuela and North Korea, he's going to be staying in Russia. And likewise, he has all of Russia as his piggy bank. He doesn't need funds abroad. It's actually other people who have funds abroad. And the interesting thing is Putin has been involved in a major program to try and push what is a very ugly expression, de-offshoreization. In other words, trying to get the elite who precisely move their money out of Russia because it's unsafe while it's in Russia, and they, they appreciate the rule of law when it comes to protecting their own assets. Um, you know, they want to move their money out. Putin wants to bring the money back in. So look, when we come to about the issue of sanctioning individuals, freezing their assets and so forth, I have no problem at all with doing it because often these are people who are human rights abusers, they're corrupt, the money has been embezzled and so forth. Let's absolutely and, you know, treat them in that way and try and keep their money and their political influence that comes from their money out of the West. So let's do that for that reason not because we think it's going to influence Russian policy. From Putin's point of view, the oligarchs have got rich on the back of his support. And if they have to then lose a million, a billion, he doesn't care. As far as he's concerned, that's the price of war. You know, he has got this wartime mentality these days. I think you know, he genuinely thinks that Russia is in an existential struggle with the West for its place in the world. Um, increasingly, his circle has shrunk and shrunk and shrunk to, you know, another set of paranoid conspiracy theorist, homo sovieticus kind of hangovers. You know, it's, it's a very specific political generation. This is why I'm, I'm, despite all of this, I'm still in the long term optimistic about Russia, because I think once this political generation finally goes, then we're going to see significant change. But for the moment, these are people who basically regard themselves at war. And you know, they're not going to change policy just because some, some rich Russian um, is, is, is going to lose some money. Their view is, well, you shouldn't have the money out there to lose in the first place. You should be bringing that money home. And if we start sanctioning them all the more, actually, it gives them an incentive to move the money into Russia where Putin can get at it. So, I, I, I mean, again, I, I think there are all kinds of good reasons for these kind of actions. But let's not kid ourselves that it's going to change Moscow's policies. Thank you. So we're now have a few questions from the audience. Um, first question from one of our board members. Um, at the Riga conference yesterday, uh, some suggested a connection between the development in Belarus and the Navalny poisoning. What's your position on that? Is there maybe a I mean, I think in, in broad terms, you might say it, it doesn't help the um, confidence of the elite and, and, and the Kremlin to see what, what's going on in, in, in Belarus. Um, as I say, I, I don't think we should draw too direct uh, a, a connection. Um, but I think what's really interesting in, in, in Belarus is that in some ways, we saw the Lukashenko regime, which did have a certain amount of public legitimacy as of, say, a year ago, lose it all. I mean, Lukashenko now, he is sitting on a, on a, on a throne of bayonets. Um, you know, security apparatus and the government structures are all he has got. And so it's amazing just how quickly that's turned around. And I think that's alarming to a regime in Moscow that, you know, has a certain degree of legitimacy still. We, we must acknowledge that. But that sense that it can evaporate so quickly if you make some bad moves, as, as Lukashenko did. So I think that's one of the reasons why Belarus is so scary. And secondly, again, the thing about Belarus is, yes, there is this coordinating committee. Yes, there, there have been some tremendously brave leaders, especially women, who have been sort of at the fore. But in the main, what we have seen in Belarus is a genuine grassroots movement. It is people who have organized themselves and, and come out on the streets and created new memes and tactics and styles and ways of essentially continuing their political struggle with, with, with this regime. 
And again, that's scary for the Kremlin because they're used to thinking in terms of everything about, you know, some specific leaders. And if ultimately, you know, if you take, if you take Navalny off the board, surely that means that Navalny's whole movement disappears. Well, what the Belarus experience tells us is no, it's not necessarily like that. And again, I think anything like that really worries a Kremlin that wants to feel in control. Okay. Um, another question is, um, why, why did the Russian government agree to let Navalny fly out of Russia? I mean, you explained that you, because of that, then it got an international, uh, 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 international uh, uh, um, affair. So why, why, did he, why did he allow that or why did the Russian state allow that? Knowing I, yeah, I mean, I, I suspect that it was a combination of the fact that they felt unexpected levels of international pressure, uh, and again, particularly from, from Germany. And, and we, you know, we have to realize the pivotal role that Germany plays in Russian thinking about Europe. Um, you know, Britain was always regarded as a sort of semi-detached, semi-autonomous country. France... France, they acknowledge this, as it were, that, that France is a significant player, but I mean, particularly, I think at the moment, you know, given um, Emmanuel Macron's kind of his own reset overtures, I don't think they were taking France that seriously. Germany, as far as they're concerned, is the critical, crucial European power. Um, and therefore, I think there's an element where, okay, with, with the Germans hassling, that's something we, we can't shrug off as easily as, as other countries. But also, it's interesting that they did, after all, delay allowing him out for a while before they finally did. Now, my assumption is that they were thinking that will be long enough. That and the flight will be long enough for whatever toxins are in his system to have broken down and it be, to be impossible to actually specifically and definitively say it was this. In this case, well, clearly they... they um, underestimated the capacity of German doctors and German scientists. Um, but I, I assume it was that kind of point of, well, we, we'll probably have to give him up because of the international pressure, because it's hard to actually refuse. I mean, what grounds ultimately can you refuse? But mm. we'll delay it long enough that we hope that there won't be any sort of particular evidence to be found. Okay, interesting. Um, another question, uh, we, we touched upon this, but what about introducing something like the Magnitsky Act in, as a retaliation uh, here in Germany or maybe on a European level? Um, would that have an effect? I mean, the, the Magnitsky laws really annoy Putin, but they don't annoy Putin for the reasons that some of the supporters suggest, which is that, you know, oh, again, it's all about the money and so forth. They annoy him because he sees them as very specifically anti-Russian acts. And he says, well, you know, what, the Chinese can put a million Uyghurs in concentration camps and, and, you know, and so forth. One can go through the whole list of other human rights abuses that are taking place. But somehow the Russians are treated especially and separately and so forth. Um, you know, and in a way he has a point. So I think that, that, you know, in this case, I mean, some, some kind of Magnitsky Act, well, first of all, we don't know who to target. I mean, what, Putin? Because his, his regime has, has, has kind of backed it. Um, the doctors in Omsk who are lying under orders. I mean, I think this is not a case that lends itself to trying to identify, unless and, and until we're in a position where we actually can say, you know, because of, I don't know, intercepted intelligence materials or a whistleblower or something. And something else I, I had sort of suggested that, you know, would, would be an interesting um, unexpected sanction is to say, okay, you know, if anyone can give us proof, proof of who actually ordered Navalny's uh, poisoning, you know, there'll, there'll be a 10 million euro bounty for that information. That'll, that'll, that'll get a lot of people sort of thinking interestedly. Um, but, you know, at the moment, we don't really know who we would sanction. This is the problem. You know, there, there are certain kind of measures that we default to that are not necessarily going to have the, the right kind of impact. The Magnitsky laws, excellent for actually punishing people who deserve to be punished. But 
there's no evidence at all that they have in any ways improved, as we would regard it, improved Russian policy. Quite the opposite, they actually create a whole new area in which the Russians therefore seek to find leverage points and find weaknesses and mobilize their own supporters and, and such like to try and basically dislodge these laws. Um, uh, so this question was already answered. Um, got another question. How can an official criminal investigation be conducted in a manner that satisfy all involved parties, EU members, Russia, etc.? Can we expect a collaborative investigation here? I mean, I think a collaborative investigation is what we should be pushing for and would be our ideal. It's going to be very difficult to get the Russians to agree, but I think, again, that, that's where we would need to put serious, serious pressure. Um, and, you know, we, we should be ready for the fact that there will be all the kind of classic whataboutist responses. You know, as soon as we start saying that, at some point, you know, when, when a you know, Syrian migrant washes up dead on an Italian coast, that's when Damascus will say, well, we demand to be part of an investigation. Or the Russians will say, we're really alarmed at all the young blacks being shot in America and we think there should be an international investigation. So they, they will try all these spurious attempts to sort of create other things. So, but nonetheless, I mean, I think we really need to push. And, and it's interesting because that actually will require some kind of um, international commitment of, of, of police officers. And frankly, these are, to, these are going to need to be police officers who understand Russian, who understand the Russian system. Otherwise, they are just going to see what the Kremlin wants them to see. And I think it says something about, you know, I, I, I do hope that, that we have made sure that we have at least some degrees of expertise within, within law enforcement of people who could be deployed if we are able to push the Russians to get there. As I said, I think it's going to be really hard. The next best thing is to demand, request, whatever, um, that all the materials for the investigation, including our full videoed interviews and the like, um, are also are provided to some kind of in international panel or through Interpol or with collaboration with Europol. I mean, there are different ways in which this can be done. Um, but I mean, I think, I think it's, you know, we have to be realistic. I'm sure at the moment, again, I mean, unless they're totally stupid, which is entirely possible, but I'm sure at the moment the FSB is busy literally and figuratively scrubbing Omsk and Tomsk and the plane of anything um, that could be considered evidence. I'm sure there are doctors who have been instructed exactly in what to be said. I'm sure there are medical records currently being rewritten. Um, you know, I'm sure there are people who sort of know too much who are currently being redrafted and being sent to a new position in Murmansk or whatever. Um, they will be making, trying to make sure that as far as possible, they have sanitized the scene. Doesn't mean we shouldn't be involved. But again, I think we, we have to accept that if we're going to find out the truth, it's probably not going to come from an investigation like this. It's probably going to come precisely from intelligence activity. And I think this is one of the areas in which actually um, Western intelligence operations can be a force for good and for shedding light on particularly murky incidents. So we have time for one more question and it's, it's a more broader question regarding the Putin regime. Um, what are the chances that the Putin regime could collapse anytime soon? Um, will he, uh, he just succeeded in extending his term? Will he serve it out? Will it take a revolution to remove him? I don't think that his goal is to rule into his 80s. Um, I think he was extending his term for two reasons. One was precisely to, in a way, take the issue of succession off the political table. Uh, I mean, it, it was absolutely true. I mean, it was, it was really striking. Um, in the last year, year and a half, the whole issue of succession had become an obsession of the Moscow political and chattering classes. Um, you know, you couldn't 
have a conversation, you know, you couldn't go out and have, have a drink or a meal with people who are in, in, in that realm without very quickly the conversation sort of turning to that. And also this was beginning to have a political impact as, as potential candidates were beginning, just beginning to find quiet ways of presenting themselves as potential successors. This was destabilizing, this was distracting, and he didn't want it to happen. So you know, it was a way of getting that off the table. And the second thing is, and it's classic Putin, he gives himself options. He does not have clearly defined long-term plans that he sticks to. Instead, his aim is to give himself multiple options so that closer to the event, he can decide on the situation. I mean, I think his ideal would be within a few years to be in a position whereby he could move to a kind of elder statesman type position with all the protections that that involves um, and the capacity to still intervene in politics whenever he wanted to, but less of the tedious day-to-day -day governance of the country. Um, but, but we'll have to see. How, you know, could this collapse quickly? I don't think we're at that state. I mean, first of all, the security apparatus is, is large and competent and on the whole, it seems loyal. Secondly, I, I mean, unlike Belarus, um, actually, you know, there, there are much more variations within the country as to who's doing well, who's not doing well and so forth. I mean, Belarus, you know, outside the IT sector, they had had years of growing immiseration and thirdly, there is still more legitimacy in the system and in Putin himself um, than in, in, in Belarus. So things can change. And if there's some kind of, I mean, I think my, my real issue is this is, I think, a system that has a certain brittleness to it. It's strong, but brittle. If there is some real unexpected crisis, um, COVID could have been that, but doesn't seem to work, you know, doesn't seem to have. Um, you know, some new Chernobyl style um, nuclear accident, you know, something else that really challenges the regime, and particularly if it's linked to regime incompetence. Not sure how well it would deal with that. And, and that could be the sort of thing that brings it down. But as I said, barring those kind of crises, I don't think we're going to see a revolution. I don't think we're, we're, we're going to see a sort of collapse. What we're going to see is a succession, and inevitably, I mean, either because people die or they just get older or whatever we can see the rise of a new political generation. And once they are actually sort of solidly in power, I think we're gonna see very different kind of policies. Not because they're nicer people, they're still kleptocrats, but they haven't got this same nationalist, post-imperial, who stole our empire from us and how can we get it back kind of um, you know, zeal that we see in, in, in Putin and his closest inner circle. They are not products of the collapse of the Soviet Union. They are products of the post-Soviet state. And I think therefore they, they will be different. So I'm, I, I'm imagining a sort of a, a lengthy transition rather than any sudden dramatic clashes. But then again, you know, a year ago, who was going to predict that Lukashenko will be on the rocks? So we always have to appreciate that stuff happens. <laughs> but you, you would only see a transition in terms of transition to other people, not necessarily transitioning to something more you know that looks something like looks something more like a western style european democracy well in the long term yeah i mean this, this is why i'm kind of unfashionably optimistic i think the interesting thing is look the next generation are essentially going to be kleptocrats rather than sort of ideal ideologues now kleptocrats the interesting thing is they have an interest in seeing rule of law because when you've stolen everything that's when you want to fix it and you want to be in a position to you know, hand that wealth on to your kids and so forth. I mean, you know, Russia is on the cusp of one of the largest intergenerational transfers of wealth the world has ever seen. And from, you know, from their point of view, they want this to be nice and stable and legal. And often you know, what you've got is a, a generation who fought tooth and nail to get vastly rich through all kinds of dubious means in the 1990s. And they're looking at their kids and chosen successors and thinking, I don't want them to have to fight the way I had to fight. And also in many cases, I don't think they could fight the way I have to fight, looking at the pampered little darlings. So I think the interesting thing is, I think you might see after the Putin generation, we're gonna see a, a kleptocrat rule of law generation. And why that matters is you basically, you can't have real democracy without rule of law. 
And rule of law is the, the absolutely essential foundation. So it's not why they will want to bring in rule of law, but actually over time, the odds are that rule of law will lead to more proper democratization within this country. So it's a generational thing. I mean, you know, ultimately by training, I'm a historian. So I'm, I'm happy thinking in these kind of big terms. It's not gonna happen next year. It's not gonna happen five years from now. But you know, if we're talking in the 10 to 20 year span, that is for me the trajectory Russia is going. So you know, it, 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 it's sometimes a useful corrective. When we're talking about all this horrible stuff and there's a regime that's very difficult to punish and it poisons and kills people and everything else, it's worth remembering that actually all things do pass and you know, there, is, there are reasons for optimism and hope when we're looking at Russia. Well, that's, that's some uplifting closing remarks, uh, especially when talking about Russia, but I fear for the time being, we still have to keep talking about uh, more, more unsettling and unpleasant things. So, uh, Mark, thank you very much. I know it's a busy time for you and uh, your fellow Russian experts right uh, these days. So, thanks for for taking the time speaking to us. And I, I guess, and I hope, and at the same time, I hope not that we will <laughs> come together again at some point in the future. But um, we always value your insights and. Um, it's always uh, fascinating um, having your your take on, on things in Russia. And My very great pleasure. Thank you very much, Mark. And thanks for everyone tuning in. Have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you, Rimko. Mark Eliotti, thank you. And thanks to our audience for your participation in today's event. To hear about the wealth of online events produced by AJC's Advocacy Anywhere program, please visit our website at ajc.org slash advocacy anywhere. Thank you again for joining us. We look forward to meeting you at future events. Until then, best wishes and please stay well.